Hi everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel of North Dakota Productions. This video is about the Chateau de Mars in Medora, North Dakota. The Chateau de Mars is a 26 room, two story house built in 1883 as the summer residence of the Marquis family. The Marquis was a French aristocrat and entrepreneur who came to Dakota Badlands to establish a new kind of cattle operation. He founded a town and named it Medora after his wife. But after three years, his operation collapsed due to drought competition from meat package in the east and the lack of his own business experience. Ed Salstrom is the assistant set supervisor at the Sato de Mars, and he does a presentation at the site. Don Eli portrays A.T. Packer. So I hope you all enjoy this video, and I will be back at the end. That you're about to see is one of a series of programs that we present right here on the porch all the way through the summer. Uh, all of these characters that appear on our porch have been researched by the State Historical Society for their factual material just, just, and historical significance. We hope also you know, for their entertainment value. Now, uh, we re rotate our characters. Today you're going to meet A.T. Packard in a few minutes, the newspaper editor. Uh, next week we bring a German immigrant who actually lived in uh, the town of Medora during the time of uh, the Marquis and Roosevelt. And then we bring back uh, the Marquesa, Madame de Morris, then the Marquis and so on. And the reason I'm telling you that is that uh, many of you are from the area, the tri-state area, and might be spending a, a little more time out of your summer out here in Medora maybe bringing in more family, uh, more friends, and so on. Uh, these programs are free. So, if you just come in on the weekends, 10, 30, 1, 30, 3, 30, Saturdays and Sundays, we present these programs here. We charge to go through the house, see, uh, and uh, in the conjunction with all our, you know, galleries down below. So that's, that's where we pay, uh, and that's where you have to show your receipt to go in and we punch that. But if you're here on the weekend, and I know uh, vacations means a new budget, you know, and you say, well, here, 130, we can still make it up to the Chateau. You don't have to stop at the IC if you don't want to. We like you to, but I mean, come on up here, sit down, enjoy the view, see one of our other programs, or bring your guests to see one that you've already seen. Welcome to happen. In 1883, the Marquis de Morris came out here with his father-in-law to become uh, the richest financier in the world, as he said. And what they were going to do was capitalize on the great beef bonanza that was already well underway, starting back in the 1870s. Thousands and thousands of cattle were being pushed northward in great herds, sometimes three, four thousand at a time, all the way, you know, coming up here to find new grass all the time, see. And this was, in 1883, the last great vestige of the open range. From here, the western Dakotas, all the way through Montana, Wyoming, over Nebraska, and so on. We've got plenty of seats here if you want to squeeze in, too. Right up front here. We're going to have a full house again here. See, right there. 
1883, this railroad was called the Northern Pacific Railroad. And that was, in 1883, the first transcontinental railroad of the North. So this vast area was now being opened up for settlement. And a straight shot right into Chicago. And so Chicago, of course, was the meatpacking center of the United States, of the world, I suppose, at that time. And so the Marquis and his father-in-law thought, why not come a thousand miles west where the cattle were <clears throat> with our own meatpacking plant over here with our refrigerated cars and our network of butcher shops all the way to New York City. We'll take on the, the likes of Swift and Armour and Morris in Chicago and we will become rich. Everybody will benefit by our cheaper prices and so on. Well, good idea, but it didn't last long. By 1886, the boom was over. It did not work. And the family left, leaving properties here. This is the house, uh, the packing plant, a good 9,000 acres here, which is in the National Park, another 12,000 in the Bismarck, North Dakota area, and so on. And for about 50 years, caretakers paid by the family watched over much of what we just mentioned. And uh, uh, by 1936, their son actually gave this to the State Historical Society of North Dakota and with the help of the Civilian Conservation Corps, Department of the Interior, this house this 26-room hunting cabin with 128 acres actually became a museum in 1941. We are in a state, constant state of restoration, and our target year is 1885, which we consider the best year they had out here. So when you go in after this program, you're going to see it virtually just as they left in 1885 and 86. Well, enough of that. Now, when they left, this little town kind of shrunk. It had gone about, it was in the 300 people range at that time, which was pretty good when you think back then. There weren't that many people at all anywhere around here. And then uh, it shrunk to what actually it is today. Stays pretty steady at all bottom line would be 80, 85 to 100 people usually. Let's see. People didn't come back, but A.T. Packard was one, and you're going to meet him now. A.T. Packard was different. He came out here from uh, uh, the east, Michigan mainly, and uh, he was not a cowboy, did not want to be working in the meatpacking plant. He was a journalist, and he started the Badlands Cowboy, the only newspaper ever produced, ever published here in this, in this town. One term I'd like you just to keep in mind uh, that we refer to his kind of uh, journalism, he's called a boomer. And at that time, when the West was being settled, boom towns were being set up all over. This was one. Probably the town you came from had its boom town era. And so, therefore, the newspaper editor became a boomer. What his One of his main jobs was to promote the area, to bring people in. So that's why, uh, uh, where we get that, that name. But uh, A.T. would come back once in a while. He, his time overlapped the Marquis and Roosevelt's by a little bit. He came a little later, but stayed to 1887, and uh, then he had to leave too. But he was wanting to come back on the railroad to see some of his old friends. And so right now, with the magic of history alive, we are going to go back to 18, well, around the turn of the century, pretty close to that, as uh, A.T. is probably making one of his visits here. So if you can... Uh, just imagine me for just a little bit. But, well, I'll tell you, well, well, I'll tell you, I was out here before the Marquis de Morris was, that's for darn sure. Yeah. yeah, I was already, I already had a cabin north on that river. Oh, seven, eight miles that way, yeah. yeah. Peaceful Valley is what we called it, yeah. Peaceful Valley. Yeah, that's the Little Missouri River. Yeah. You know, you know much about that river, do you? No? <laughs> I'll tell you, out here in the corner, a lot of our rivers act a little screwy, you know. They, they flow the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they go north. Yeah, yeah. Well, this one starts way down there in Wyoming. Yeah. Now, there's a big hunk of rock down there called Devil's Tower. Yeah. Now, that's where she starts. Oh, she's just an itty bitty thing down. Oh, I'll tell you, you stand right over the top of her. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, and then she makes her way up the prairie, uh, cuts out this uh, pretty country up here. Yeah, that, that's what the little mo does. That's where I met the Marquis de Moore's first time back in 83. Yeah, 83. Oh, I'll tell you, when he rolled up to my cabin one day, I'll tell you, well, there was quite a dude out there. Yeah. I mean, he was he he was armed like a battleship. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he had ideas. Kept talking about all oh, what he was going to do down here in this new town that he built, named after his wife. All oh, that. Yeah. We're all going to make a lot of money, and this is going to be a big city. All that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, he convinced me, and that's when I started working for him back. Then. Well, I remember when that town was nothing. There was just a few tents and but. Pretty soon we had church and schools. And we had a newspaper. Yes, sir, we had a newspaper, A.T. Packard, Badlands Cowboy. All the news from the world came right down here in the Badlands. Yeah, we had real good reading in those days, yeah. And then 86 rolled around, and well, that was a shock, I'll tell you that. All of a sudden, late in that year, the family left. Yeah, everything closed down. Now what do you do? You got a bunch of buildings all over the place and nobody in them. Well, but to tell you the truth, I'm still working for them. Yeah, I still, uh, James Foley down there, yeah, he's the ramrod. He keeps us busy trying to keep up the property in case that family wants to come back. Yeah, well, Mark, he's not coming back. You probably heard about that. But anyway. <laughs> Friend of mine, I just the train that still not too long ago came in from the west. And while I came up here, and you know, sometimes I meet an old friend of mine. He was a young friend of mine, A.T. Packard. Yeah, young fella started the newspaper business here. Yeah, yeah. We had, like I said, a lot of good reading then. But you know now, well, it gets kind of lonely out here. That's why I'm kind of glad to see all you folks coming up here, check out the old place. Looking at the scenery, well, you can look all you want, it's not going anywhere, so just relax. <laughs> but if you see A.T., I don't see him right now, I like to put a pot of coffee on the back there, and we talk about things that, what would have happened in this country if the Marquis' ideas ever came around, but whatever. But, uh, well, enjoy yourself. Uh, well, I'll... Bye, Scully, A.T. <laughs> Hey, I, I was just talking about you to these folks. Yeah, that's the truth. Say, folks, well, I'm going to get that coffee on. Uh, yeah, you can visit with O.T. Packard here for a little bit. Yeah, you'll enjoy that. Yes, I can do that, and I look forward to the coffee. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon. Good to see you. Been in Medora long? A few hours? A few hours? A few days? Week. A week? A week. All right. You are not dressed for work. <laughs> you must be here to see our magnificent Badlands. Or maybe you are here for work, just dressed to make an impression on a future employer. <laughs> You'll get over that in a day or two. When I came here in December 1883, Pyramid Park Hotel looked pretty good to me as I walked over from the depot. Two-story building, nice white facade. Different story inside, let me tell you. I met the proprietor, Frank Moore, in Mandan. Maybe you've seen him. Red shirt, fringe buckskins, high boots, a little bit oily, but friendly for sure. Well, Frank saw to it that I had a good supper, and then I went over to the bar to write a letter to the folks back home in Indiana. By and by, Frank strolls over and says, You ought to see an artist to go to this cowboy! Look down the end of the bar. That's a real cowboy. Well, I did. Sure enough, the fellow looked to be the genuine article. Hat, shaps, gun belt. I began to write out his description for the folks back home, checking him from time to time to get the details right. After a while, he noticed me watching him. I saw Frank go over and whisper something in the fellow's ear. But I didn't think much about it. I finished the letter and decided to take it down to the lightning jerker at the depot. Ask him to mail it on the eastbound train. I went over and opened the door. I had never felt such a gust of cold air in my life. After I caught my breath, I thought better of my intention and decided to stay in the room with the hot stove. Next morning, the sun was out and the temperature was actually quite pleasant. I went out to see the town of little misery. 
didn't take long. <laughs> to the west were the rough log buildings of the old cantonment, built in 1879 to house the army troops sent out here to protect the railroad workers. There were a few frame houses going up. Just across the tracks at the foot of Graveyard Butte was an assortment of huts and shacks. There were already two men buried in the cemetery atop the butte. You can thank Jerry Paddock for that. Well, for the first one for sure, probably for the second one as well. You want to watch your back around that fellow. <laughs> Just south of town, Antoine Amade, Marie Vincent Amat, Manca de Valombrosa, the Marquis de Maurice, and Montemaggiore had built this 26 room hunting cabin. Sprinkled money all over everything out here grass, sagebrush, prairie dogs. Before the locals knew it, he had built a hotel, a general store, and a huge slaughterhouse. There was a young politician from New York out here as well. Maybe you've read his name in the newspapers, Theodore Roosevelt. From what I've seen and from what I've heard, that fellow could be president someday. As a matter of fact, I said as much to Theodore himself on one occasion. We're coming back from Dickinson's first ever 4th of July celebration. Theodore had been the keynote speaker, and we were sitting on a couple of hay bales in the, in the back of a, in a freight car watching the prairie glide by the open doorway and the fireworks popping and the darkening sky behind us. And we were discussing his speech. By and by, he said that he felt that he could do his best work in a public and political way. I responded immediately, then you will become President of the United States. He was silent for a time, which was unusual for, for Theodore. <laughs> but I could see that the idea was not entirely a new one to him. And when he finally spoke, he said, if your prophecy comes true, I will do my best to make a good one. Now there were a couple of things in that speech that he said that particularly struck me, and I made a note of them, and with your indulgence, I would like to share them with you. This is what he said. Like all Americans, I like big things, big prairies, big forests and mountains, big wheat fields, railroads, and herds of cattle, too, big factories, steamboats, and everything else. But we must keep steadily in mind that no people were ever yet benefited by riches if their prosperity corrupted their virtue. Each one of us must do his part if we wish to show that the nation is worthy of its good fortune. Here we are not ruled over by others, as is the case in Europe. Here we rule ourselves. When we thus rule ourselves, we have the responsibilities of sovereigns, not of subjects. We can continue to preserve them in but one possible way, by making the proper use of them. In a new portion of the country, especially here in the far west, it is peculiarly important to do so. That's what he said. <coughs> that was in 1886. In 1883, I had yet to make the acquaintance of Mr. Roosevelt. He was camped out by Chimney View. I took my horse and went out to pay him a visit. Beautiful country, in a peculiar sort of way. General Sully called it hell, with the fires out. <laughs> Teeming with wildlife. Quiet, too. None of the commotion I'd gotten used to back east. Suddenly, I hear hoofbeats coming up fast behind me. <laughs> Where's that? cowboy I'd seen the night before. He rode up alongside and we commenced to talk. Didn't take long for me to realize he was looking for information. Well, I had nothing to hide, so I answered readily enough. Finally he says, so you're a newspaper fella. That's damn funny. <laughs> Frank Moore told me you was a deputy sheriff looking for a horse thief. <laughs> Hair on the back of my neck rose. Where was you headed when you started to go out last night? Well, I told him. He looks at me and he says, I figured you was going to telegraph something. And if you'd have went, I'd have killed you. <laughs> well, we 
rode on, <clears throat> talking of other things. A little more than a year later, the horse thief met his maker at the end of a rope. I was the chairman of the vigilance committee that hanged him. We want to watch your back <laughs> around here. <laughs> You might say I've got printer's ink in my blood. My father, Jasper Packard, was the editor of the Laporte Chronicle for several years. I was his managing editor at the tender age of 13. Went to Oberlin College in Ohio studying the classics. After two years, I followed my father's footsteps to the University of Michigan studying journalism. I didn't just sit on my books either. I was the first varsity baseball player ever to throw a curveball hmm. playing for the Wolverines. One of my teammates, Moses Fleetwood Walker, was the first black player ever to compete for a National League team. I took my degree in the spring of 1883 and stepped on a train for Dakota Territory. Took a job as managing editor at the Bismarck Tribune. Folks, you couldn't swing a cat over there without hitting somebody who wanted to talk your ear off about these badlands. I just had to see for myself. After I had a good look around, I decided that Medora needed a newspaper. So I went to see the Marquis de Mores. Once he realized how useful a newspaper would be for his enterprises, he wanted to finance the venture. All I wanted was a building to rent. Well, he finally let me have the blacksmith shop next to his livery stable if I would run ads for his Northern Pacific Refrigerator Car Company. Now, the blacksmith shop was about 30 feet long by 20 feet wide, chimney on the west, door on the east. The inside was covered with builder's paper. It's a pretty good windbreak in the winter, if you keep a sharp eye out for creases and punctures. I ordered the Washington hand press, a job press, and a sort of job and body type. I arranged with the Northwest Newspaper Union in St. Paul to supply me with ready print. A large cannon stove filled with lignite coal from my own coal mine. Kept the place warm. <laughs> Although on occasion, I have to admit, my keg of printer's ink did freeze solid. <laughs> and I had to set it next to the stove and use the ink as it melted. Now the ink melted on the side next to the stove, but the other side stayed as hard and <laughs> solid as the keg itself. <laughs> February 7th, 1884. The first issue of the Badlands Cowboy hit the streets of Medora and Little Missouri. Now, the Marquis de Mores paid frequent visits to the newspaper office, and he usually had a news article he'd written about himself all ready for me. <laughs> <laughs> Most of those went directly into the waste paper basket. The Marquis de Mores was charming and full of aristocrat to the bone. I always felt that I was pretty well placed in his esteem, at least until our final disagreement, but I was never his good friend. Now, undoubtedly you've heard about the shooting of Riley Lefsey. It was reported in all of the newspapers. The Marquis was brought to trial accused of murdering Mr. Lefsey. My testimony was that the Marquis could not have killed Lefsey, as the caliber of the fatal bullets were different from those the Marquis was shooting. The Marquis wanted to prove he had killed Lefsey mm -hmm. and be discharged on a plea of self-defense. Hence our disagreement. After his acquittal in Bismarck, he came straight to the newspaper office. As he came through the door, he said, I have killed one man and will kill another. Well, before he could draw his pistol, I grabbed up the ever-ready iron side stick and jumped to within striking distance. By words only, I managed to convince him that he was mistaken on both ends of his argument. Hmm. That was our major disagreement. Otherwise, we had the same interests of every man out here. We wanted a business boom for the town of Medora. My intention was not so much to bring news of the world to Medora as to send news of Medora out to the rest of the world, providing the 650 subscribers to the Badlands Cowboy with a useful and entertaining weekly newspaper published not for fun, 
but for $2 a year. Now Medora is the natural jumping off place for a route from the Northern Pacific Railroad down to the Black Hills. The Marquis went to Washington, D.C. in order to secure a mail contract. And believing that all gentlemen must be men of their word, felt that he had accomplished just that as a result of a firm handshake. We got the Medora Deadwood route open the first week in May. Over 200,000 pounds of freight moved in and out the first month. Now, in order to ensure that my reporting was accurate, I determined to take a trip on the stage line. We rode for three days through all extremes of weather. Bone-chilling cold, 130-degree days, and hail that left us black and blue. Weather-beaten but triumphant. We came out on a butte overlooking the Belle Fouche Valley. Ted Wood fairly took my breath away. It truly is the metropolis of the hills. There were brick buildings. There were electric lights in all of the businesses. There was a telephone line that connected Deadwood to all the towns in the hills. And just 185 miles south of Medora, the nearest rail point, and every item that could not be manufactured in the area had to be shipped in by wagon. The success of the Medora Deadwood Stage and Forwarding Company was assured. But fate, that ever fickle mistress, decreed otherwise. The Marquis did not succeed in getting the mail contract after all. The Dickinson route took over all the business, passengers and freight. Bunch of shysters fairly stole it away from us. Uh, but that's a story for uh, another day. The weather dealt the harshest blows to the Badlands and to the town of Medora. When it began to snow softly one evening in November, we didn't think much about it, regarding it as the usual heavy, wet snowstorm of late fall. But by night, the temperature had dropped to the 40s below zero, and the Badlands were in the grip of one of the worst blizzards in history. Followed by another, and another, and another. Cattle froze to death and starved to death by the thousands and the, the hundreds of thousands. By the time spring arrived, there wasn't a rancher in the area who hadn't lost at least half his herd. Most had lost much more. Cattle business in the Badlands never recovered. Medora's boom was bust. Now, I had moved my presses from the old blacksmith shop over to the empty officer's quarters at the abandoned Katona. The better to accommodate my position as a married man. I married Janie Hayford in Oberlin on May 27, 1884. On a cold, windy night. January 12, 1887. A fire that started somewhere in the Katona and we were burned out. Records, presses, nothing. But my time in the Badlands are in the town of Medora survived. So, a little more than three years after I arrived here, we boarded the westbound Northern Pacific from Montana, where I edited a, another newspaper. And now, just about as many years later, I ought to be getting down to the Depot for the eastbound train to take me to Chicago. I've always wanted to be a sports writer. If you're ever there in the vicinity of the Chicago Evening Post, look me up. <laughs> you know, that old depot reminds me of an example of the efficiency with which the cowboy was often able to get his news out to its subscribers. Now, one time, I received word that the Montana Stranglers were planning to hang a couple of horse thieves somewhere in Montana. I got the news on a Thursday, and I published The Cowboy on a Thursday. 
but being fully aware of the efficiency with which the Stranglers carried out their business once they had determined to do it, and not wanting to lose the opportunity for some excellent copy, I published the story as an accomplished fact. Got down at the depot just as a westbound train was pulling in. You will imagine my discomfiture to see the two proposed victims step down onto the platform. <laughs> And there I'm standing with the newspapers reporting their demise under my arm. <laughs> well, after a couple of moments of thought, I consoled myself with the fact that I knew that they couldn't read. <laughs> so I sold the newspapers anyway. They got back into the tray. The train pulled out from Montana, where they were, hanged, on schedule. Oh, you want to watch your back around here. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. I sure hope you all enjoyed the presentation. That was Don Ely. He portrays A.T. Packer, the 1980s editor of the Badlands Cowboy newspaper. Well, I had a chance to interview Don Ely after his presentation and he tells me more about his character of A.T. Packer and as well as what Don does for the Chateau de Mars. Uh, Don also explains how many tourists they get at the Chateau de Mars each year. All that and more information you'll find in this exclusive interview with me and Don Ely. So thanks for watching and I'll be back. So tell me a little bit about the act that you put on. Okay, this is a gentleman who was here during the time the Marquis de Mores was, 1883 to 1886. 87, Packard was here a little longer. His name is A.T. Packard or Arthur T. Packard. He was the editor of the Badlands Cowboy, the only newspaper in Medora, North Dakota, and at that time, Dakota Territory. And he is our eye on the past because it's through his newspaper we know a lot of the things pretty much all we know except for Roosevelt's writings uh, that happened in Medora and Little Missouri during those years. Okay. So how long have you been studying about Teddy and Roosevelt? Uh, it's, it's about eight to seven to eight years that I've been actively working on, on this particular character and Roosevelt as a result because the two of them did interact. But I've been working here in Medora in History Alive in one way or another for about 15 years. Okay. Have you acted in anywhere else? In Dickinson, I've, I've acted quite a bit in uh, the college theater, the university theater, the community theater, so I have some experience in that. Okay. All right. So, uh, where do you see yourself like, in, in the near future? Is, is that the work that you are in now? Since we're coming up on the 75th anniversary of the site as a museum, we're kind of looking toward that as the important issue, so I see taking a major part in that, I guess, with the rest of the people here and making sure that that goes off very well. And I also teach at the university, so I, I have that as a... You, you teach at the I'm an university. adjunct, yes, so I, I okay. teach oral and turp, public speaking, and then I work out here as well. So those are, that's where I see myself in the near future. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, good. Well, wish you the best of luck with that. Thank you. Uh, talk a little bit, a bit about the house and what, uh, what's inside the, the house. Okay, the house was built in 1883, and the furnishings that we have in it, 85 to 90 percent of them were here when the family was here and were actually used by the family. So we've been very fortunate that way. The house was occupied by them from 80, well, from the spring of 84 through the winter of 86. And we have such things as the dishes, the books, uh, the furniture, of course, almost all of that is original but a lot of interesting artifacts that were actually used by human beings 130 or so years ago. Okay. How many tourists do you get? I believe last year we had around 30,000 that it had come through the, by the time it was all over, but that was an extraordinary year because the oil boom was still going and we had people coming out of the woodwork during that time. But, but in the house uh, we will have around 200, maybe 150, 200 to a day will go through. So. So I'm looking at the whole of, of, of Medora rather than, than just the house. But the house, uh, the Chateau de Morris, uh, we usually have around 200, a little less than 200. Most days, some days less, some days more, depending on, okay. on how it goes. Mm -hmm. So do you know a lot about Medora itself? 
a reasonable amount. I'm more conversant with the past than with the present, but I do have some idea of the, the present as well. Uh, uh, tell me a little bit about what you know about Medora and some of the, the things that go on there. Okay, well, it was founded by the Marquis in 1883, and it boomed for three years, then it collapsed, went back to a very small country town for most of its history until Harold Schaefer in the 1960s, and that was its rebirth. And the interesting thing about that is they were both businessmen, but Harold Schaefer was also a very intelligent and clever businessman. He was able to make his dreams work, and that's brought back the, the town so that uh, the musical took over or from, the, from Old Four Eyes, developed into, a, into a more of a, I wouldn't say Broadway-type musical, but it's working in that, that direction. And that brings in a lot of people, and that benefits those of us who are also working in the history aspect because we're still here. Welcome back, everyone. Well, now I want to talk briefly about the town of Medora. Here are some pictures of the town. I was in Medora with my family last summer. We had an awesome time. We visited some museums, and we pretty much just drove around the whole city of Medora. They have a lot of haunted buildings and uh, bars, restaurants, and gift shops. What I really liked was the gift shops. They have a lot of unique merchandise that you won't find anywhere else. Another biggest tourist attraction about Medora is the musical. Um, I did not have a chance to go to the musical this year, maybe some other time. When you are in North Dakota and you're traveling along I-94, make sure you stop by at the Visitor Center uh, near Medora. There you can view a wonderful scenery on the Black Mountains. It's absolutely a wonderful thing to see. It's really spectacular. The scenery is very awesome and you saw a little bit of that in my beginning credits. Um, also, I plan to leave a link in the description on the Chateau de Mars house. That'll be in the description below this video. Um, it's a website about the house. There you'll find a lot more information that I didn't get to cover in this video. So otherwise, I want to thank you all so much for watching. My name is uh, Matthew Kronberger. Um, please comment and subscribe to my YouTube channel of North Dakota Productions. And please uh, comment and subscribe. I really appreciate it. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope this video was helpful for all of you looking for a tourist attraction site to visit when you're in North Dakota. So otherwise, I guess that'll be it for this video. So thank you so much for watching and take care. And shot. <laughs> Bully. Bully. I got that. Wonderful. Well, that's a face worthy of Mount Pup Rushmore, right? Yes. Stone face. Fully. Fully's coming right yet. But it's panoramic. It'll be in 360. Actually, it'll be on Facebook. Oh, Fully. 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 Fully.